Hello friends, my name is JJ. And one of the good things about having made YouTube videos for as long as I have is that you can document the evolution of trends over an extended period of time as well as the evolution of your own thinking. When I first started making videos back in 2015, I was pretty partial to the idea that a lot of US state and city flags were quite bad and should probably be changed. And as the years went on, this opinion became more and more mainstream and started to achieve a great deal of political success. A large number of American flags were either changed or are on the brink of being changed, to the point where I think it is now easy to say that the United States is firmly in the midst of its most substantial period of flag reform since at least the 1960s, which is when a lot of major American cities adopted flags for the first time, or even the early 20th century, which is when a lot of US state flags were created. But success should also invite reflection. And I must say, when I look at the many flags that have been changed over the last few years, I am starting to become more convinced that maybe flag reform was a mistake. Maybe the new flags aren't actually an improvement over the old ones. Maybe the old ones had some worth that got lost in an increasingly faddish rush to change for the sake of change. And now, paradoxically, a movement that sought to make American flags more deliberate and meaningful is really just making them more forgettable and pointless. So my inspiration for making this video was the recently unveiled proposed new flag of Minnesota. Earlier this year, the Minnesota State Legislature voted to authorize a flag redesign committee, capping off years of lobbying from a growing swell of politicians increasingly devoted to this cause. One such politician was Representative Peter Fisher, a co-sponsor of the bill that was eventually passed, and a man whose position on the flag was characterized like this in a 2022 AP story. Fisher said that two high school students came to him in 2017 with concerns about Minnesota's flag, including its similarity to 19 other blue state flags with seals on them. The flag also uses too many colors, isn't simple enough that a child could draw it from memory, and isn't distinct enough to recognize when seen from a distance, he said. Those are all guidelines for a good flag provided by the North American Vexillological Association, which ranks Minnesota 67th out of 72 US and Canadian state and provincial flags. That's a great quote because it really encapsulates a lot of the spirit behind the American flag reform movement. A lot of it is driven by a sort of insecurity and embarrassment that has been fostered by young people, and especially the North American Vexillological Association. Their 2001 pamphlet, Good Flag, Bad Flag by Ted Kay, has probably been one of the most ideologically influential documents in modern American history at least when it comes to flags. It is quoted endlessly and uncritically, with people often engaging with it as a document of revealed truth rather than opinion. As I discussed in a recent award-winning video, Good Flag, Bad Flag posits that the goodness of a flag is broadly tied to the simplicity of its appearance, as measured through a few tests, such as the aforementioned ability of children to draw it or it being identifiable from far away. And this line of argument has proven extremely persuasive, despite the fact that it's all deeply arbitrary. As I said in the video, given that flags are now almost entirely decorative objects with no functional purpose, there is no logical reason beyond aesthetic preference to declare that a flag that looks one way is objectively superior to a flag that doesn't. A flag isn't like a knife or something where if it's too dull to cut the meat, it has definitionally failed. A flag is just a cultural symbol and the goodness or badness of a cultural symbol cannot be tested with pseudo-scientific criteria, as we shall discuss later. But anyway, the new Minnesota flag was really striking to me because it kind of felt like the grim culmination of this whole ideological movement. And I felt that way because my first thought upon seeing it was just this overwhelming sense that I have seen this exact same flag so many times in recent years. For instance, a while ago, I made a short about the new flag of Cedar Rapids, Iowa, which feels like it's more or less the same thing. The Cedar Rapids people had been on the receiving end of a lot of bullying for their old flag, which was designed by a high school student in 1962. And so in 2021, they obediently changed it into something that now, quote, follows the five basic principles of good flag design published by 
by the North American Vexillological Association. The Cedar Rapids flag, in turn, reminded me a lot of the new flag of Duluth, Minnesota, which was unveiled in 2019, as well as the flags of Burlington, Vermont, and Pocatello, Idaho, and Ogden, Utah, and Reno, Nevada, and really most of the other cities that have been changing their flags since 2017 or so, usually by citing the good flag, bad flag principles in the aftermath of a shaming campaign that denounced them for naught. But city, state, and regional flags are another story. <laughs> there is a scourge of bad flags, and they must be stopped. <laughs> So, looking over this collection, we can observe that one of the main consequences of the American flag-changing movement has been the imposition of a rather striking visual conformity on American flag culture. The unpredictable stylistic wackiness that once reigned over the flags of American cities is now slowly being chipped away in favor of predictable geometric flags with stylized rivers, mountains, and stars. And as the new Minnesota flag and the new Utah flag before it shows, this appears to be the favorite approach for redesigned state flags as well. Now, as that quote from before mentioned, a lot of US state flags have long been infamous for looking so similar, but that similarity is the result of a tradition of using the state flag to honor the state seal, which at one time were considered the most important symbols of a state's political sovereignty. The reason why all of these flags look so samey, by contrast, is just because Ted K's aesthetic rules are so strict and confining and don't leave a lot of space for creativity. As a result, instead of an artistic project, redesigning a flag becomes more like a math problem in which you are using a precise formula to get to a single correct outcome. Make a rectangular image representing a place using only geometric shapes and solid colors, the fewer the better, and any distinguishing symbols of said place must be rendered as abstractly as possible. Couple this with the fact that a lot of American communities tend to have a rather inflated sense of the noteworthiness of their mountains and rivers, and what results is an abundance of limited palette flags made of triangles and rectangles. If you're lucky, you might get away with a flower or curvy line once in a while, although old CGP Grey will probably have a conniption about it, so beware. She put her favorite flower in the center, which is a bit too complicated for my liking, did not like this design, and given time to reflect upon it has but changed my position to do not like harder. Now, there is obviously plenty of stuff that can be said in favor of the math problem approach to flag fixing. Abstract geometric art is a perfectly defensible style, and flags done in this style can be very lovely. I likewise think that a big reason why the Vexillological Association's movement has been so popular is because it capitalizes on a basic desire to improve our communities with simple solutions to easy problems. And it's certainly hard to argue with all of the positive energy that has been released as the flag changers seek to do just that. But I do think that the partisans of this particular ideological movement have also oversold the positive consequences of what they're doing just a tad, with the sameness of the improved flags reflecting a kind of fundamental misunderstanding of how symbols work and why some symbols are more loved than others. So I don't think it goes without saying that the new flag of Cedar Rapids is destined to be as beloved as the flag of Japan, for instance, even though a lot of the flag reformers will explicitly make these sorts of analogies. Okay, so here's a question. Why is it that, say, the French flag is so popular? Is it because it's three solid stripes of color? A masterpiece of elegant and efficient visual design? Perhaps that is part of it, but I would argue a much more significant variable is just that France is an extremely famous, powerful, important country that a lot of people love very deeply. So it was on some level inevitable that a symbol of this mighty and beloved nation would become super well known and affectionately plastered all over everything. A contrasting example would be the flag of Australia, which by the standards of flag experts is not a very good flag. It is very colonial and derivative, and this little constellation of stars over here would hardly make most people's list of the top 10 most iconic Australian things. In fact, I think most people learn about the Southern Cross from the flag, which is kind of backwards. But Australia nevertheless has one of the most recognizable flags in the world because Australia, much like France, is also a very famous and distinctive country that a lot of people like. So anything associated with it winds up being well known. Or how about the Dutch flag? I have personally always found it to be very boring just because of how much it looks like the French flag and how little it seems to capture the distinctive character of Holland. 
But Dutch people really like their flag anyway, and you see it everywhere in that country, both because the Dutch have a very overt sense of patriotism and because it's a flag that has just been used for a very long time and is thus very much bound up with their sense of themselves as one of Europe's <laughs> oldest civilizations. And the inverse of all of this is true as well. As I said in the previous video, even when a people are mostly indifferent to their flag, like say the New Yorkers, that doesn't seem to correlate with their relative amount of pride, especially if they have plenty of other symbols to express their identity through. In other words, I don't really think there's a lot of evidence to suggest that there's a hard one-to-one -one correlation between how a flag looks and the role that that flag plays in a culture. So so judging a flag's cultural strength based entirely on its adherence to modern, minimalist design sensibilities can be pretty ignorant, just because that criteria would have never been used to understand the worth of a flag until quite recently. I think I also said in the previous video that it is also the case that a lot of the design of the old European flags, the ones that are often held up as the gold standard of good flag design today, were determined as much by the technological limitations of mass-producing decorative cloth products in a pre-industrial age as anything else, as well as functional considerations like using them to identify the political allegiances of ships on the high seas that are simply not relevant for most flags today. I feel like a lot of American city and state governments are therefore being sold a kind of pseudoscience by activists who have gotten a bit tipsy on their own conventional wisdom, a conventional wisdom that few seem willing to challenge these days. Changing a flag is often presented as a strategy strategy that will help a community build local pride, improve public branding, increase souvenir sales, even drive up tourism. And this is all based on the premise that as long as you follow the rules, you will create a flag that is very memorable and easy to love. But the five good flag, bad flag rules that are offered up as the surefire recipe for this success have wound up proving rather underwhelming and contradictory in practice in my opinion, largely because obeying the first four rules often eliminates the possibility of the fifth. And this is because truly distinctive things usually have to be a little bit audacious to really be unique. In art, distinctiveness comes not just from a visual style, but also the spirit of independence and self-confidence that that style is seen to embody. When I see a flag like this, I don't see any self-confidence at all. I see timid conformity with somebody else's rules in a desperate plea to be liked. A flag like this one, by contrast, is bursting with a kind of oblivious, cocky energy. The Milwaukeeans have been heavily mocked for it, and since 2016 there has been a whole organized movement to replace it with this. But there's also been a backlash to the backlash in which other Milwaukeeans have rallied around the classic flag in an affectionate and at times even semi-ironic way. Now, I don't know a lot about Milwaukee, but hearing that there is at least some cohort of people over there willing to defend this flag over this one is, to me at least, something that makes the place sound a little bit more intriguing and interesting than if it was just another city with a star and mountain flag. But on some level, it also doesn't surprise me. The fact that people can have genuine affection for a rule-breaking symbol is a classic example of the gritty effect I talked about in my video on mascots. When the Philadelphia Flyers invented a mascot for their hockey team in 2018, they deliberately created something that wasn't stereotypically cool because they correctly concluded that there are too many cool mascots these days and they've all become boring and forgettable. They thought that an unapologetically weird mascot would be a lot more fun, and it's an assumption that seems to have paid off, with Gritty fostering a ton of genuine goodwill and pride among the Philly public and bringing a lot of global attention to Philadelphia and the Flyers. Other brands do this all the time as well. They create consciously strange advertisements or logos or mascots that nevertheless often build deep and genuine affection because they combine elements of playfulness and rebellion that appeal to our desire for individuality. They are often controversial, but that controversy can evoke a sense of defensive loyalty as we seek to take the side of stuff that other people just don't get which is the sort of in-group mindset that is critical for building community. Now, I don't want to come off as somebody who's just done a complete 180 and is now opposed to any changing of any flag in any context. A significant component of the American flag reform movement has been driven by a desire to remove racist imagery from some flags, which is obviously defensible. And it does seem like the project of changing a flag is the sort of healthy, low-stakes, non-partisan civic exercise that a lot of people 
rightly crave in this era of intense political polarization. But I think that the new Minnesota flag is also a monument to the idea that the American flag reform movement has in many ways kind of jumped the shark. Ted Kaye's good flag, bad flag rules have been embraced too dogmatically, and a movement that once seemed energetic and innovative now feels like a force for stagnation and mediocrity. My humble advice as a non-resident foreigner is that going forward, a better flag movement would be one that encourages Americans to rally behind the flags they already have, seeking to understand, appreciate, and defend the flags that represent their community's identity even if they don't conform to someone else's rules. And if a new flag must be created, it should aspire to be something genuinely distinct, something modern and creative and interesting and brave, something like the multitude of actually innovative submissions that come in from ordinary people whenever a flag redesign is first proposed, but are then promptly cast aside by the big shots in favor of yet another star, river, and mountain number. If there is to be a third great period of American flag making, let us make it one that will actually utilize genuinely 21st century American ideas instead of continuing to fetishize European flags of centuries past. The purpose of flags is different now, the technologies available to make flags is different now, and our collective ability to promote and popularize symbols is different now. For an age of such remarkable opportunity, the smallness of ambition of the flag reformers can be pretty jarring. In conclusion, I think it is possible to aim higher than this. 